this got to be the cleanest Star Wars intro ever. Because I legit forgot that I was watching Star Wars for a second. And I thought that I was back to playing Cyberpunk 2077 all over again. Because this is clean as hell. See what I mean? There were haters. There were doubters. There were people that sat in their basements whining and moaning about how Star Wars didn't have any direction. That the Mandalorian's plot wasn't going anywhere. But there were pieces. There were breadcrumbs. There were those of us that were dedicated and tuned in every single week, obsessing over every single minute detail that knew that we were building towards some dope shit. And that dope shit has arrived. Because you cannot tell me that Moff Gideon does not have the baddest intro drip of any Star Wars character outside of Darth Vader because his intro where he's just chilling in his in his evil lair and he turns around and walks down that corridor that doesn't make sense but I guess it's there for security purposes with those guards standing at attention I was like first off I need a hot toy of Moff Gideon second off I need a hot toy of those guards because they look dope as hell but then but then we arrive at the end of the episode and your boy drops in in that fresh Mandalorian drip. He spent $20 in the cash shop and bought himself the Darth Vader Mandalorian skin. And I am absolutely here for it because it looks absolutely fantastic. Man, there's so much stuff going on inside this episode. It is not even funny. Just taking it off the top. The Imperial Shadow Council. Yes. We are we are building toward so uh, a point of reference on the side. During Star Wars Celebration, we know that Dave Filoni is going to be directing a movie that is going to wrap up the entire story of Ahsoka and The Mandalorian and all of these other shows that are happening post Empire, right? It is dope. That before we get Ahsoka, we get the Shadow Council to see all of these Imperial remnants that are basically working together. And I like the fact that Pelion is there. And he's trying to tell people like, yo, we gotta be coy. We we you know we 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 gotta we gotta operate under uh, underneath on un, un, behind the scenes. We can't let the New Republic know what it is that we're doing out here because we have to make sure that we're prepared for when Grand Admiral Thrawn arrives. And Moff Gideon is like, motherfucker, I've been fighting, like, <laughs> I've been fighting for like the last ten years. And Moff Gideon's ass, Moff Gideon, Thrawn's ass ain't returned once. What I look like waiting for somebody that may or may not show up, and when they do show up, it's just gonna take my power. And I like the fact that, like, he basically uses the the, the hunger and, 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 and the need for violence that the other people on the council uh, require. And he feeds into their egos to get them to give him what he wants. But at the exact same time that we're seeing the Shadow Council, we're also seeing references for all of these other things that we know happen in the sequel. Like, for instance, Colonel Hux. I believe he was a colonel, but a Hux is there, who is most certainly the father or the grandfather of General Hux, who's going to be leading the First Order later on down the line. He's interested in the cloning technology. His Imperial faction is the faction that is basically all about cloning. And we know that that is in relation to Palpatine. That Palpatine's off there on Exegol, which... That's probably the worst part of the lore, but I guess we're going to have to work it in and stick with it anyway. He's off somewhere because, you know, somehow Palpatine is going to return and he's cloning himself and he's going to clone a, a human version of himself who's going to go off and sleep with a random woman and end up having Rey. And then the entirety of the sequels is going to happen. That's why he's there. But at the exact same time, Thrawn's setting up his whole debut that he's going to have in Ahsoka and that he's going to have continued 
in his own fucking movie where I'm hoping they tie up his story and give that man justice because if anyone in Star Wars besides Darth Vader needs to be given and done justice it is most certainly Grand Admiral Thrawn but moving on from there I love the Mandalorians because the Mandalorians are like they're they're they're, they're like that big family that one family moved to the south and went to Georgia and another family moved north and they went to New York and both of these families haven't interacted with each other for maybe like 16, 18, 20 years. And grandma decided that she's going to bring everybody back together for one big old function. And they all get back together. And you have the Southern Georgian family. And then you have the, 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 the stuck up New York family. And both sides don't like each other. The Georgians think the New Yorkers are stuck up. The New Yorkers think the Georgians are, 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 are just not even up to tax. They're not up to them. Like, like they think highly of themselves. And I love that there's tension off the bat. I also love like that small hint that happens when everyone takes off his, their helmets and Mando, Mando is just like, bruh, come on, son. Can we have like kept the helmets on for like three seconds? I'm really not trying to have y'all box. And I like that it wasn't an instantaneous liking of the both, between both sides. It took punches. It took a fight. Then it took an understanding. Like, you see Paz going through, like, emotions when he's on the ship. And he's looking down at, basically, what's left of Mandalore. And you have, um... I can't remember his name, but bo number two. Um, <clears throat> Reeves. Where he's like, you know, I was actually here. I saw, essentially, the planet burn. And then there's that moment where it almost feels like Paz felt sorry for him. Because for Paz, he's seeing this destruction for the first time, so he's a bit melancholy. But for for but for but uh, Wolves, he was there. Like, he was actually in the fighting. He saw everything get lost. And the entire journey on Mandalore is fantastic. First off, like I've said before, like, having the Mandalorians drop, like, a elite special force commando unit is dope as hell. The fact that they ran into pirate Mandalorians with their little pirate ship sailing across the ruined wreckage of their home world, dope as hell. Absolutely love it. I love the fact that we get more backstory from Bo-Katan answering the question as to how exactly Moff Gideon got the Darksaber, where she gave up. She surrendered. She decided that the lives of her people were worth more than her honor. She did the right thing, and in doing the right thing, Moff Gideon stabbed her in the back, took the Darksaber, and nuked the entire planet, and she lost everyone anyway. And I like the fact that it's Mando who goes up to her, basically when she's doubting herself. And he's like, look, your lady Bo-Katan cries, and I'm sworn to stay by your side until this mission is done. Until Mandalore is returned, until your honor is redeemed, until our people have a safe home. This is the way. And I'm like, damn. If, if only we could have a husband like Mando, who always has our back. That, that when, when, we're in our, when, when we're in our dire straits, when, when we've lost all hope, he comes in, he pats us on the head, he tells us that it's going to be okay, and then he says, this is the way, and we get right back down to fucking work. And if I thought that, like, that emotional thing wasn't going to be the most emotional thing that was going to happen, I was absolutely wrong. Because in came the Imperial Mandalorians. And I have to say, I give it to Moff Gideon that he looked around at the galaxy and he went, who are the most dangerous people in the galaxy? And he was like, space wizards and space knights. And he was like, okay, we're going to take both sides and we're going to mush them together and I'm going to make something new that's more badass than both the wizards and the knights. And he created his imperial, his new imperial troopers. And they're fantastic. Oh, the Beskar armor. I love the fact that the Beskar armor requires them to fight each other. Kind of like how John Wick was fighting the, uh, the armored assassins in like the last two movies. Where you have to shoot them in the joints or go for like the neck where there is no protection. Love it absolutely love it because you're seeing like blastables just ping off of each other's armor and then they gotta run in and get just up close and personal 
with 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 killing each other and getting everything done. And then if I thought that that wasn't gonna be badass, they gave my man Paz like the the the, the perfect send off for his character. Because when I was looking at the character, I was like, you know, I'm I'm not really enjoying the character. He's constantly trying to like fight Mando. He has an attitude problem. But then. This episode was like, oh my god, now that I think about it, this episode was like a major death flag for Paz, because he had so much character development in this episode, there's no way he wasn't gonna die. But at the exact same time, I like the fact that he allowed Bo to basically escape. He hit the button, he shut the doors, and he decided to hold his fucking line. And my man was a goddamn tank. He fought every single one of them hand to hand. His weapon ran out. He used that as a club. He ran up, snatched Homeboy up, smashed him on the rock, threw the other two off the cliff. Absolutely fantastic. And then the second those freaking Praetorian guards walked around the corner, I was like, yeah, bread ain't. This ain't for you. This is, this requires a Jedi. Someone get on the hollow and call Luke Skywalker. Someone get on the hollow and call Luke Skywalker. His ass has been on that planet. Ben Solo is not born yet. He has no apprentices in any way, shape, or form that he's training. Ain't no Padawans on that planet. Luke Skywalker needs to drop in because we have some enemies that only he can fight and defeat. Because the second they broke out those swords and the energy axes, I was like, nope, we need a Jedi. We need a fully trained Jedi. So you're either going to get Ahsoka or you're going to get Luke. Somebody got to show up to save my boy Mando because once again, he has been captured and it's either going to be a Jedi that saves him or Bo-Katan has to go save her husband. Something has to happen. But this episode was absolutely fantastic. I loved it. I loved it from start to finish. This is, as I said before, The Mandalorian is top tier Star Wars. Is the story sometimes slow? Absolutely. But you have to understand the mantra of the show. The mantra of the show is a guy making his way through the galaxy with his son. And he just ends up being roped into a bunch of bullshit. It sticks to its guns. And it doesn't deviate from that formula in any way, shape, or form. And I appreciate that. I like the stories that are being told. I enjoyed this episode. I thought this episode was dope as hell. Let me know what you think about this episode. Comment down below. And I will catch you in the next one. Peace.